Hi, this is Brian Kim. I'm going to share with you the right way to handle the dense posterior polar cataract. Number one, you want to hydrodilineate and you do not want to hydrodissect. Hydrodissection is when you use a fluid wave to dissect the posterior capsule from the lens. If you have a posterior polar cataract, you have a defect in the capsule, so you don't want a fluid wave going to that defect. And so hydrodilineation splits the lens within the epinuclear and endonuclear layer, which is away from the capsular bag and away from the defect. Number two, you want to do gentle lens disassembly and avoid lens rotation and avoid downward force on the posterior capsule. Remember, there's a defect in the posterior capsule. You want to avoid rotating the lens, which applies torsional stress on the bag. You don't want to do any sculpting maneuvers when you're pushing down on the lens, and this causes stress again. You have a defect in the capsule or bag in the back, and you don't want to be pushing down on the lens. So you want to do a maneuver that is capsule or bag friendly, zonular friendly, and that's why I'm using mechanical fracturing techniques, double chop, cross chop. You will see how beautifully this technique works. You'll be able to prolapse pieces out of the bag, and this is a very gentle way to disassemble the lens. And number three, you want to leave the posterior polar area last for epinuclear and cortical removal. And so when you're removing the epinucleus, you want to go around circumferentially 360 degrees and loosen up that epinucleus off the bag and then get to that defect area last. And same goes for the cortical removal. You want to tease the cortex circumferentially and go after the area where the polar defect is last. Because just in case there is a defect or a hole, at least you've been able to mobilize all of the lens material when you get to that step. So as you can see, this is a moderately dense lens with a polar appearing plaque on the center of the posterior capsule. I'm using a cotton tip to help center the eye and I use a corneal marker to help me center and size my rexus. I use a cotton tip to turn the eye so that I can have a more flat approach with my paracentesis blade, flat and parallel to the iris plane, first on the right side, and then use a cotton tip to turn the eye the other way, and I make a paracentesis on the left side, again, staying flat to get a nice corneal shelf, which will allow me to have a very nice self-sealing corneal incision. I'm gonna inject some intracameral lidocaine, and then some dispersive viscoelastic to coat the corneal endothelium and expand the anterior chamber. I'm gonna do my triplanar corneal incision, make a vertical groove, and then stick the blade into the deep part of the groove. I'm using the cannula to turn the eye away from me, go into the deep part of the groove, tunnel through the cornea, and then when I'm ready, I'm gonna go in, but I'm using the cannula to turn eye toward me, and that's to try planar corneal incision. I'm gonna do my puncture style capsular excess, push down on the wound, and then just gently tease, turn my teeth a little bit, tease into the incision, and then I'm gonna puncture centrally, and then I'm gonna pull downward towards me. The capsule didn't go towards me, it went to the left, so I went ahead and found the edge, and I'm starting to go around circumferentially, trying to find the corneal mark to help me center and size my rexus. Just grabbing every few clock hours, going around. This is a capsular fornix hydrodissection technique. I place the cannula out to the contralateral equator, but instead of going to the capsular fornix, I'm gonna point it into the meat of the lens between the epinucleus and the endonucleus. I'll go ahead and push, but I didn't really get a clean wave, but you can see that the lineation point is there. So I'm gonna find that same point, point it back down, and you get a beautiful hydrodilineation wave. Again, this is a wave and a ring that has been created between the epinucleus and endonucleus. And you're gonna notice I didn't spin the lens after hydrodissection. And so with this technique, I don't have to spin the lens. And with the posterior polar, you definitely don't want to spin the lens. You're gonna see how easily I'm able to disassemble this lens. And in fact, when you're doing my chop technique and you're learning the technique, it's actually advantageous to create a hydrodilineation wave because that's actually the point in which you have to place the chopper. So I lift the incision and go with irrigation off into the eye with minimized decimase trauma. 
I'm removing the surface epinuclear material. And you can see I want to place that chopper underneath the anterior capsule and then right in that ring space between the epi and endonucleus. I'm going to turn the phaco tip vertically subincisionally. I crush the lens completely in half. If you pay attention, there was no vertical stress on that capsule or bag when I did that technique. Place the chopper out to the contralateral equator, pulling the chopper centric to the phaco tip, and then it crushes the right hemineucleus. Again, all of the forces are towards the center. There's no downward force. This is very zonular friendly, capsular bag friendly. I don't have to rotate the bag. I don't have to put any stress on the bag. All the forces are being applied within the bag without any force on the bag. And I'm able to crush the lens because I'm using opposing forces with the instruments to crush the lens pieces. I was able to pull that first piece up and crush it with mechanical fracturing forces. Now I pull that second quadrant up out of the bag with a chopper, and then I'm using mechanical fracturing forces to chop the lens pieces into smaller pieces. If you're doing sculpting techniques or even vertical chop, vertical chopping is very limited because you have this short, sharp, pick-like instrument and you have to do this vertical movement and you're trying to crush the lens vertically. The problem with that is if you need to chop it like I did with the cross chop, there is no way you can do that maneuver with a vertical chopper. It's kind of a one trick pony if you're used to doing vertical chop. Yes, it's an easy way to break up dense lenses and its strength is with dense lenses, but its liability is if you can't rotate the lens, you're really kind of stuck. And if you have soft lenses, vertical chopping is really not nearly as good with soft lenses. And so in this case, I turn the lens in front of me, the second hemineucleus. I place the chopper out to the equator. I crushed it. And then I mechanically fractured and removed that third quadrant. At this point, I take the chopper out and push some more dispersive viscoelastic to fill the anterior chamber. And then I'm going to go back with my chopper and take out this fourth quadrant. I'm gonna turn the quadrant in front of me, place the chopper out to the equator, pull the lens piece up out of the bag. Again, because of this technique, it requires a very long chopper, but that is such an advantage because you can hook things, pull things out of the bag, and in situations where you can't chop the lens in your normal configuration, I can chop lenses and pull lens pieces up and out of the bag from any which direction. With divide and conquer, with vertical chop, you have really one direction and you have to move the pieces and rotate the pieces to accommodate your technique. Whereas this technique can be done from a variety of angles. And because the chopper is long, you can hook lens pieces very nicely. So now the entire endonucleus is removed and I'm gonna go around circumferentially and I'm trying to tease up the epinucleus all around me, grabbing at the anterior capsular epinuclear edge there. And it's almost kind of like a little bit of a bowl effect. And so I don't want to hydro dissect the epinucleus up. I could visco dissect the lens piece up, but rather you're going to see I'm going to use the chopper to very carefully and very gently pull that epinuclear piece up and out of the bag. I'm going around the edge of the epinucleus here, subincisionally. I pull it up and I'm teasing and I'm teasing and I'm going around it and I'm teasing more. So I'm able to very easily and gently prolapse that epinuclear piece with the chopper very gently. And again, this is all through mechanical forces. If you try to use vacuum or aspiration to do this, you could do it, but it's just less controlled. I trust my hands with the chopper more than I do with the machine. So I push BSS, come out with the phaco tip, and then I'm gonna to switch to the INA handpiece. But before I do that, I'm actually gonna go down in a low IOP setting because if this has got a defect in the posterior capsule, I'm gonna to go to a low IOP. So you can see I'm dropping the IOP significantly here. And then I'm going in and then I start my IA and remove the cortical material. So I'm start sub incisionally removing the cortical material. Again, I went to a low IOP, assuming that there might be a defect in the posterior capsule. And again, this is just to reduce that intracapsular pressure. And so I'm going around, you can see there's quite a bit of almost like a fibrotic effect 
and appearance to the caps of her bag. I'm going around as far as I can, as gently as I can, to go around getting that cortical material. Again, there's a lot of material still adherent to the bag, despite my best effort. You can see also get a lot of wrinkling in the bag, and that just tells you there's some weak zonules as well. Thankfully, when the epinucleus came out, it became more clear to me that I might be lucky here. I don't actually have a defect in the posterior capsule. But nonetheless, all of these principles are still valid. All of these things we should be prepared for in case there is a defect. And so all of these techniques are still very, very good. I remove all the cortical material. Now I'm polishing underneath the anterior capsulorexis edge of any lens epithelial cells. going over the posterior capsule area as well. Now that I know that there's no defect, I'm a little bit more aggressive in trying to remove that fibrotic material that's adherent to the posterior capsule. This polymer tip is quite helpful with this. I'm able to be a little bit more aggressive and remove and grasp that lens material without any fear of rupturing the posterior capsule. And once I do this, I place the BSS cannula and pulse the subincisional space into the capsular fornix. And you can see there's some cortical material that was liberated. And this is a very nice way to do the capsular flush and to remove that remaining subincisional cortical material. Now I'm going to inject some cohesive viscoelastic into the capsular bag. And then I'm going to do the capsule sweep, sweeping on the left side first, removing the lens epithelial cells and any potential cortical material. And then I'm quickly switching to the other side and doing the same thing. I'm going to inject the single piece acrylic intraocular lens into the capsular bag, making sure the leading haptic is within the bag. The remainder of the lens is in the anterior chamber. As it unfolds, I'm going to go in with the INA handpiece, inflate the eye, make sure that leading haptic and then trailing haptic are off the optic, rotate the lens 90 degrees, tilting it, making sure both haptics are in the bag, and then remove all the viscoelastic from within the bag. pushing the lens down and sweeping underneath the anterior capsule edge. And then I'm removing the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. This is, in my mind, the best way to handle the posterior polar cataract. Anytime you can't spin the lens in the bag, anytime you have to be very careful with the zonules, anytime you don't want to apply any pressure on the bag, it doesn't have to be a posterior polar, it could be anything. It could be uh, weak zonule cases, small pupil situations. You have to have a technique that can be adaptable and usable in so many different situations. Again, with sculpting, you have to sculpt in one direction. You have to turn the lens into your direction, in the direction of the phago tip. And if you can't do that, that poses problems. Vertical chopping is the same thing. You have to chop in the direction with making that vertical movement. You need that stubby, sharp chopper to create that vertical force to crush the lens works well with dense lenses, not so well with soft lenses, and you can't do cross chop. You can't pull pieces up out of the bag with that technique. With my technique, the chopper is longer, it's much more versatile. Not only can you crush the lens pieces into smaller pieces with opposing forces, and this is a very gentle way without touching the capsular bag, you can pull pieces out of the bag, chop the lens pieces without having to spin the lens within the bag. So these are my tips on how to handle the dense posterior polar cataract. The best technique is the most versatile technique. So you want to be able to learn techniques that will help you get out of difficult situations, including the posterior polar cataract. So I hope this was helpful to you, and I thank you for your attention.